<laughs> Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. Thank you for tuning in today. I am here to talk about the Great Reset, but not the one you're thinking about. We are going to reset our lives from this current uh, condition of fear that has been imported on us, has been actually dumped on us and, and squelching us and wanting us to be beaten into submission from the very power that we're supposed to pay attention to, which is God. And I brought on my good friend, Mark Mallet to discuss this very important topic. And I, I can do more talking, but I'm going to turn it over to Mark to say, Mark, what are people afraid of today? Or is it easier to say, what are they not afraid of? <laughs> Well, you know what, it, it, as you were saying that, the words came into my heart, pandemic of fear. Yeah. We're living right now, the worst thing right now is a pandemic of fear. And this fear is seeping in even into the hierarchy, into our priests, which I think is a real uh, portent, uh, you, you know, not important, but portent of what is going on in the world right now. And, we, and uh, the Lord wants his people, he's, he's waking us up, but he wants us through this webcast to understand what our authority is in him, understand his power, understand who we are in him, because all this has been lost. And, and, and I really think this spirit of fear, Christine, got a stronghold in the church the day we shut the doors and said, you can't come to communion. We're too afraid to come into our churches and receive the Holy Eucharist. That resulted in a stronghold in the Catholic Church across the entire world. And that stronghold, now that it's in the church, is now beginning to affect its members. And so we need to individually and hopefully corporately expel. As, as St. Uh, Paul said, he said, the weapons of our warfare are not worldly. They are strong, he said, for taking down strongholds or fortresses. And the greatest fortress right now in the church is fear. And I, you know, I want to share with you, um, and my readers who read me on the nowword.com have heard this before. And this was, uh, Christine, maybe seven, eight, nine years ago. A friend of mine, a wonderful Catholic woman, she, she's a, a very devout, has a daughter who is a special needs girl. And ever since she was young, she has been given visions and dreams of seeing angels and demons battling. Wow. And uh, this is really authentic. And I, I, I won't forget this because we've now seen it fulfilled that it was about eight years ago, roughly, um, that she saw in a dream, Our Lady appeared to her and she saw this battle with demons and angels. And Our Lady said to her, she warned her, she said, there is a demon coming into the world, a demon of fear, and you are not to engage with it. And she said, it would, this would try and take over the whole world. And so she said, you need to have recourse to the sacraments, confession, the Eucharist, and so on, and and, and to not engage this particular uh, um demon of fear and by that it means not to listen to it but we have listened to it as i just said in in our introduction we did listen to it and fear has now really gripped uh the entire world and the church and and uh, but jesus is here to the rescue and he wants us to understand today in this webcast his power and the power we have as christians and so there's hope <laughs> if you are struggling with fear out there who are listening Amen to that. You know, it's a, a funny meme I think about. I had seen when this whole pandemic first began, which was the picture of the Amish and someone was talking to them and saying, why do you guys not have COVID? And they go, we don't have TVs, you know, and it <laughs> right. made perfect sense. I have not had my television on since January 20th of 2021. Mm -hmm. And when I say I haven't had it on, I literally have not turned it on except if my husband and I want to cast YouTube to it and watch like one of these shows or um we we will pull up I will usually say give me a good Catholic movie which it always takes me back to 1945 or something <laughs> because they haven't made a lot of great movies but the point of it is is we have so much peace because we're not watching the daily shootings and what state or the the terrifying things happening in a certain place and I've had, someone said to me recently, the well, you need to know what's going on in the world. And I said to them, well, what's happening at 8, 818 Baker Street? And they're like, what? What's happening? I'm like, well, I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean? And so, well, something's happening there, but the media is choosing not to tell you. I said, something's happening at 6037 Capitol Place, right? And so I said, 
what we're being chosen to being put to 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 consider, to think about, to ponder, to dwell on is being chosen by the people who run those media. And so we have decided to choose what we put into our own brains. And it is so essential, Mark, to us. We just don't live fearfully. We live these lives of peace. And it doesn't mean that we don't have crosses. I'm sure you and your family have crosses and things you have to deal with. But that is one of the biggest ways that the enemy is is getting into us, is trying to get us to hear, these are the stories you should hear. These are the messages we want you to get. Be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. It could yeah. be you. It could be your city next. It could be your school next. You know, things like that. And so this is really important to not oh, oh, yeah. let this yeah. demon, as you said, take over us. Don't pay attention to him. Yeah, you know, Christine, what you just said is golden. And if uh, people tuned out of you, they need to go back and hear every word you just said, because you're absolutely right. We are living in the midst of one of the biggest propaganda campaigns in the history of the world. And uh, I love the way you said it, is there's all kinds of stuff going on here and there. But what you are receiving in the media right now is a deliberate, what is called a psychological operation or a psyop. Yes. It, it really is, folks. Uh, trust me, I'm a journalist. Uh, I, it, this is my my industry. This is what I'm in. I understand. I've been in the back room of the newsrooms. I've seen the politics. I've seen how choices are made editorial-wise. And I have seen my industry be completely inverted, especially in the last four, three, four, five years, where it is now no longer uh, news that you're hearing. It is propaganda. It is deliberate what you're hearing. It is filtered. It is incessant. Um, and and it's working. And, and it's fear-mongering. It's just it's fear-mongering. Fear when is the last time we heard really great stories because you know the i know you live in canada i live in america at the end of each story the here's your happy story for the day and they'll do some feel-good story but come on it's the last two minutes of a, a, an hour of television right. and it, they anyway anyway so we could go so yeah we could fear but is we're not what, going to but we're not going to right <laughs> but we're looking at people still wearing masks and they don't even understand I, my husband and i because we've been living in a hotel for a month um went to a restaurant last night again and you know people are wearing their masks and now they're not even covering their noses and i'm thinking to myself so you're wearing a mask because you think it's doing something but you're not wearing it properly because you want to breathe it's like it's just habitual to wear the masks the studies aren't there uh, the the people who are uh, it, it's just every where right. the things we're afraid of we're, we're afraid of going to church still yeah. we're afraid sure but of... a lot of people have not returned to church now um and and you know that that was that's another fruit of having shut the doors and said to people that the eucharist is too dangerous for you to receive it's too dangerous for you to come and pray too dangerous for you to dip your hand in holy water and the irony is uh, of all this, and it's extraordinary irony, is that it was actually in, we know in the history of church, Eucharistic processions that were done in, in Rome, for instance, that were helped to bring to end a pandemic, that we are we actually have blessings with holy water to drive back plague and disease. And we no longer b believe in these graces. And so um, what do we believe in then? What do we got left to believe in? Well, here, here it is, science. Yeah. The religion of science has replaced the religion of faith, faith in Christ. And so what we need to do now is be able to bring our listeners in this webcast back to he who is greater than he who is in the world. Mm -hmm. The one who lives in our hearts is greater than he who is in the world, Satan, whose time is, become, is very short right now. And this is why there's so much violence, why there's so much hatred, so much division. He's doing as much damage as he possibly can before christ comes in his victory and chains him in the abyss and that is coming that yes. is coming so yeah christine yeah these are fear is a real thing uh there's also the fear we just want to identify what some of these fears are right now can you hold on um, i want to yeah. say one thing i want to yeah. say something good that's coming out of that though is that they're pushing this fear thing so much that people are starting to wake up. And before I say that starting to wake up part is I wanted to point out, you know how when you look at someone, you think of it and it keeps leaving and coming back to your brain and keeps leaving. 
So something keeps leaving my brain. Maybe I'm not supposed to say it, but when it does come back in the next time I'll say it, but the fear of, of, um, all of this is getting so redundant for some people who have their eyes open that those who have their eyes open, even if it's a small remnant, are saying enough is enough. And I just read a news article today that talks about France and the Catholics there were so fed up with their churches being closed that they literally took a battering ram and beat down the doors of one of the churches. Wow. That, Mark, from the inside was also bricked in. So they thought whoever the the bad guys that shut the church down not only shut it down but they wanted to make sure in case people got through the doors they bricked it up with cement on the inside and i'm thinking wow that's crazy of as you said earlier the church hierarchy but god is waking up the people who are going enough is enough um right. the, the the thing that kept leaving my brain Mm -hmm. I got to say it. You, the only thing I want to correct you on is you said they're paying attention now to uh, the God of science. And I'll say no, because if they were paying attention to the God of science, which we have for the past 50 years, they're actually paying attention to the God of media because science isn't even true. If you can be this alphabet right. soup mafia thing, and yeah. that's not based on science. Um, a lot of these things, the virus is not based on science. It's so it's, it's, um, the god of media so that's the thing i kept wanting to say so i've just given you kind of yeah. two areas but one yeah, of no, I, I, and i agree with you i agree with you entirely on that because we've been told over and over again we must follow the science follow the science and we've been given anything anything but actual good solid science because science would be an endeavor in which we hear all sides but we've only been hearing one side mm -hmm. from the father of lies and now yes this is being exposed now, um, although, you know, I was just having this conversation yesterday, it's being exposed. And those of us who are now listening in the alternative media and the alternative media is where you're going to find the truth, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and but a lot of people can't even break away from CNN and CBC and uh, NBC. They can't. They're so afraid to go into the alternative media because there's the conspiracy theorists. And yet right. they absolutely believe every single word coming out of a painted anchor uh, as if that is truth, and they're not willing to go beyond it. And I've seen PhDs acting like this. I'll send them something, a video posted on Rumble, and they'll go, oh, well, it's posted on Rumble. It can't be true. I mean, this is insane thinking out there, but this is the level of fear uh, and paranoia that has gotten into people who are so afraid. And this is another thing, fear. It's the fear of the conspiracy theories, which... Those are some good points, Mark. Um, but what what exactly is the difference between what we're hearing on the main media and um, conspiracy theories? Well, well, I think um, you know what we're you know I I heard it recently. The difference between a conspiracy theory and an actual conspiracy is about nine months. <laughs> and uh, right. you know, I mean, I'm reading uh, papers in science coming from top level scientists all over the world who are coming out and saying, "Look, we've been duped." We were wrong. But, you know, you're still not hearing this in the mainstream media. And this is why I think we're saying be careful about tuning into the mainstream media and listening to so much of what you're listening to, because you're listening in a great, a great deal of it is from the father of lies. And so yes. if you're not in prayerful, if you're not discerning, if you're not wise, if you're saturating yourself with this stuff, you are listening to the spirit of fear. You're entertaining it. And so even for me, I mean, you know, as a watchman in the church, I am now breezing over headlines. I am not getting very deep into stuff, getting enough information and moving on quickly. Um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting to people that we shouldn't watch and pray. Correct. You know, our Lord tells us, you know, to watch the signs Be of alert. the times. Be alert. But what does that mean to watch the signs of the times? Does it mean that we have to be up on every single news item? And I don't think so. I think we have to understand the spirit of what is going on. And right now it is the spirit of Antichrist. We need to be aware of this, how it's operating, how it's deceiving people and not be deceived ourselves. Yeah. And so, you know, we've talked about a fear of Jesus in the Eucharist. The church has told us, be afraid of receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. Oh. Be afraid of each other. And we're the body of Christ. So now be afraid of Christ in your neighbor. 
And this, how could this not come to a point where we actually fear God, that this virus or whatever it is in the world is stronger than God himself and that we have nothing but science to save us. So this is kind of where we're at. And Christine, I want to say this. We, I know people are starting to wake up and they're starting to fight back. And I'm not saying this to make people afraid, but what is coming in the world will we'll, we'll shove us back down again. And, and that spirit of fear will be twice as strong, which is why it's so important what we're going to say in this webcast, that people understand no matter what comes in the world, Christ is always stronger. He's, he who lives in you is, is greater than he who, who is in the world. In the world. Mark, one of the best words you said that is sticking with me was saturated because you said you don't want to be saturated in the media and you also don't want to be saturated in these other ones that you're, you know, that you and I will follow the, what did you call it? The um, alternate media, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I did just what you did too, because I used to read those articles, but now I read the headlines and I'm going, okay, got it. I know what's going on. Every now and then I'll click on it. But I am a runner. I run marathons. And for years, I didn't run with anything in my ears, but it got kind of boring. So after 20 years, I just yeah. the past like three, four, five years ago, started wearing AirPods because I just thought I got I got to do something. I got to hear stuff. But recently and literally within the past month or so, I have just felt the Lord saying, take them out. And when we get saturated, here's what we need to get saturated in silence. Because if we are not listening to the mainstream, we don't have to listen to the alternate, you know, pay attention, right? Be alert, as you just said. But how often are we just saturating ourselves in the silence of God, going for that run with nothing in our ears, just walking down the street, doing the things that we used to normally do before the fear factor set in. And if you can do that, I think God is going to speak to us so, so loudly and so clearly and direct us to the people that we need to talk to. I mean, he's just been so amazing with things like that. You just bump into someone going, God meant yeah. for me to talk to you. You're right. You're right. And I just came off of a nine day silent retreat. And I, I want to share with you an experience I had Can't wait to hear. on this retreat. And before I do that, um, I, I want to say, you know, we've often heard people say, well, silence is the language of God. And uh, I, I, I actually would like to tweak that a little bit and say, no, silence is where God speaks. Because when you actually become silence, you realize God is speaking to you all the time. He's directing and guiding you by his divine will each and every moment. And and so the silence is crucial. And, you know, I walk into people's homes at times and they have the TV on 24-7, constant noise or the radio, they get in the car, the radio is always on. And we need to enter into that silence so we can hear the voice of Jesus. So how do we know we're hearing the voice of God? He, maybe, uh-huh. maybe this is where we answer need to start. that because that's what people ask me all the time. So go ahead and answer that, Mark. Well, Jesus says in John, I believe John chapter ten, he says, "My sheep know my voice and they follow me." Well, that's all of us. How how do we know we're hearing the voice of Jesus? And this is how. Jesus says, "My peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not." as the world gives, do I give to you? Mm -hmm. The peace of the world is, um, it's, it's a kind of false peace and a false calm. You can get that false peace, a buzz from alcohol or drugs. You can get it from sex. You can get it from even just from going up watching, um, you know, a sunset or something. And I'm, I'm, let me just say, I experience God and encounter him in nature. Sure. But the peace I'm speaking of is something that is so deep, it transcends anything that the world can manufacture, anything. It's the peace of Christ. And so this is how you know the voice of Jesus. When you Are you listening to him in your heart? And let's say you're discerning something, a direction to go, something you need to do, something you might need to say to someone. You pray about it. You come into the silence and then listen to the voice of Jesus. Ask him the question. And this is where, you know, even journaling comes in, Christine. Um, I've been journaling for years. and But one thing I've done recently, and one of the things I've learned on this retreat, is ask Jesus a question and then listen in the silence. And you need to come into that space of listening. And I, I just found when I would ask Jesus the question, it, the words would come because I was listening. And he said, my sheep will know my voice. And this is how I knew it was his voice. Because what I sensed him saying, what I was writing, there was a peace in it. 
And so sometimes the most logical thing in your head that you need to do is not what God wants you to do. What he wants you to do is actually the opposite. But you won't know that if you're stuck up in your head, if you're stuck in just thinking, and this is the way I need to do it. And not that reason doesn't play a part. It does. But ultimately, you need to you need to sit down and go, okay, this is what I think is reasonably the best thing to do. What do you think, God? And you listen. And every time, Christine, where I have reasoned it, I figured it out. I wrote out the options, you know, whether it's buying a car or whatever it might be right. that I've had to do, but I haven't had that peace. I felt there's a bit of compulsion or I want to reach out and grab it. I want to do it before I lose the opportunity. Man, it's been the wrong decision almost every time. Yeah. But those times where I have felt something needed to be done and my wife says no, and then I stop and I listen and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't have peace, really. I really don't have peace. Honestly, I'm being honest with myself. Mm -hmm. And so this is part of it is, you know, God, Jesus said the father desires those who worship him in spirit and truth. So we need to come into the space of the Holy Spirit, into that silence. And then we need to live in truth, listen to the voice of God. And the first thing is stop being afraid that if you don't have control, yes. if you don't get what you want, you're going to miss out on something. It's a lie. The Father always has better blessings for you than you can imagine. And this is something I have taken a lifetime to learn that God the Father has my best interests as a kid. But, you know, we're afraid to believe that, Christine. We actually no. believe, no, no, as Catholics... It's the, it's the cross for us that's suffering. Everything is suffering. To be a good Catholic means you must suffer. All you can do is suffer. It means no more fun. It means- You are so right. You know? That's no, exactly the, the Catholic mentality for many people. Sure, sure it is, you know? And and it's a lie. Because yeah. one, when you enter into the divine will, when you enter into God's space of doing, it becomes a glorious adventure. Every moment with mm -hmm. God becomes an adventure because now you suddenly see with him how he turns even what seems to be bad into something beautiful, something that seems horrible into something great. He takes manure, yeah. even the manure of our mistakes and our sins, and he makes something beautiful grow from that. And only God can do that. I know. If we let go, if we stop our control and we stop listening to that tape recorder <laughs> or CD on repeat <laughs> or MP3. Okay, whatever. You get the idea. <laughs> you, we stop listening to this on repeat. Yeah. <laughs> Saying to us all these lies. And so, Christine, it, maybe this is the time I should go into what happened to me on this. Yeah, retreat. I've been dying to hear. He's M Mr. Mallet told me about this retreat beforehand, and he's been holding this off on me. And I'm like, let's just get to the part <laughs> in the story. Tell me about the retreat. <laughs> well, I, but going into this retreat, um, this past year, I think after everything I've done, the 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 spiritual warfare around me and my family has been uh, off the charts for me. Um, and in the last month before this retreat, um, it was getting really intense to the point where I was starting to feel helpless, and the enemy was starting to repeat lies in my head that were bringing tension between my, me and my family members. Me and my wife, uh, me, I think even in my 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 um my ministry and everything. And I was walking in this fear that that I was being judged and rejected by everyone around me. And uh probably ultimately in a deep sense rejected by God, although you know, not really. I mean, I was still waking up in the morning and praying. And you know, my prayer times with the Lord were actually beautiful. I would come out of them with peace because he was there. Yes. But as the day wore on, Christine, all of a sudden, these lies would begin to take over more and more on these lies. And I would start to live in a place of fear and anxiety and tension and feeling like around the next corner, I, I the, the, the hammer is going to drop. Everything's going to crumble. Yeah. I'm going to be persecuted. Uh, I'm going to lose my keys because the enemy hid them. My wife's going to say something that that's going to hurt my feelings or something stupid like this. And in that last week right up to the retreat, the enemy came in with a lie. And I won't go into it, but it was so deep, Christine. I couldn't, I was 
praying through it. I was rebuking the enemy. I could not stop it. And I was in tears. I was literally driving and weeping and saying, Lord, I cannot deal with it. I can't stop this. Jesus, you've got to stop it. And the enemy was just, it, it, Relentless. I, said, I said to my spiritual director, I said, this is the equivalent. If St. Pio got thrown around his room physically by a demon, I said, this is the mental equivalent. And I said, I can't, I can't stop it. And finally, I went to confession the night, uh, I think it was the night before the retreat. And it stopped. And I just, I, and I want to say this to those who are listening. Can I give you a little tip as a Catholic? One of the most powerful means of, of combating the spiritual attacks of the enemy is confession. Now, some people go to confession because they feel guilt. And that's called scrupulosity. That's another form of fear. God does not want you to live in that. So no, going to confession to get rid of scrupulosity actually only plays into that scrupulosity. Hmm. What you need to go to confession for is to confess your sins and then completely trust and rest in God's mercy. And for people who are dealing with addictive sins like masturbation or alcoholism or so on, well, you, you might need some help beyond that, but... But you have to understand, still in that sacrament, Jesus is there to help you. He's there to love you and embrace you. In fact, he even said to St. Faustina, should you come to confession that your soul was like a decaying corpse, my mercy is so great that I would restore that soul wow. completely. Whew. And I've experienced it. I've experienced the mercy of God where I've gone in in complete darkness into confessional like beyond anything that I can lift from myself and be completely delivered. So exorcists say that a confession is, for most people, confession is the most powerful exorcism that you can yes. receive. Because most, uh, most of us are dealing with oppression, not, not possession. That's more, that's rare. But oppression, where demons, and people have seen this in the spiritual realm, literally where a demon will latch onto you. And I wonder, Christine, if this fear hadn't latched onto me, because by the end of the day, I was so dealing with this fear and trying to overcome it, you know, and still taking out all my weapons, the rosary and fasting and prayer. And it wasn't that God wasn't doing anything. He was. But you know what God was doing? He was bringing me to a point where I needed to see exactly what was going on, because it wasn't about the rosary not being effective. It wasn't about fasting. Those were being effective. He was bringing me to the point where all the graces of that were going to deliver me. So I get to this retreat, Christine, and to make a long story short, I enter into this silent retreat. And in the most, in the first three days, the Lord, be, and it's a beautiful the way this retreat set up. It's called Triumph. For those of you who live in Canada, or if you want to fly to Canada, if you can, it's called Triumph. They're being done in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And I think that they there's nothing like it on the planet. And I you said it was nine days? It's nine days. It's I know that's hard for people. They don't, you know, it was for me, it was in, in dollars. It was 1300 Canadian dollars. And I know for some people it's too much. And uh, uh, actually somebody, actually a benefactor helped cover that cost for me because I'm in ministry. Thanks be to God. Right. But it, the program itself, I think was created by Our Lady, and it's uh, it's the beginning of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart in some respects, just the way that God is beginning to illuminate consciences all over the world right now. So, but I, I, I this is why we're having this webcast right now because I want to share with you some things that I've learned that you can apply. That if you can't go to a retreat like this, and many of you can't, you're not helpless. I mean, it's only biblical truths that we were taught. It, it's not like we were taught something new. But when you hear them all and you enter into that space and you start to listen to the voice of Jesus, you give him an opportunity to work. And so I entered into that space and I began to see how what the Bible tells us about who we are in God, that we're made in his image and that we're good and that, you know, how he entrusts us in the garden with his with to, to be stewards. That means he he loves us. He trusts us. He puts faith in us. He sees us as a reflection of his own image. These are the truths of who we are. And when you're baptized, it's that times a, a million because now you, you know, oh, happy fault. Now you're not just created in God's image, but now we have been given 
within us the divine trinity who is transforming us more and more into from glory into glory that we become partakers as saint paul says in the divine nature this is extraordinary but we lose that we if we're partakers in the divine nature why are we afraid to walk out our front door seriously um so in the first three days, Christine, I entered into these truths, and there were so I I cried so much, <laughs> I probably dehydrated myself. I was drinking so much water because I I wept as I realized I was believing lie after lie that had nothing to do with the truth. And and what I would do then during this retreat, I was repenting of these things. Jesus, I'm sorry that I believed the lie that I'm not loved. I mean, I'll take you to one incident in my childhood I never thought was a big deal, but I began to see how the enemy used it throughout my life. It was in kindergarten, and we had this gift exchange, and all of us were to buy a gift and exchange it. Well, the boy who was supposed to buy a gift for me forgot. And there I was standing there as this mm. little boy. And, you know, I didn't cry anything. I just remember feeling so ashamed and so embarrassed by it that I was forgotten. And you know what, Christine, from that day on, I've, I've always kind of been apart from the group. All through my school years, I never really, I had friends, but I never really had friends. And I, my brother became my biggest friend. And eventually my mother became one of my dearest and closest friends. And my family became my friends. Even through high school, my brother's friends were my friends. And I, you know, when I left into university, this carried on. And I even think into my ministry, I have always felt, and in some respects, I've been set apart for the work I've done, just the right. way you're set apart, Christine. But the Lord doesn't want me set apart from the body of Christ. He doesn't want me to not be loved by the body of Christ and, and to love in return. And I think that's been hard for me, especially with the ministry I have as a watchman, as and that's a, was a calling John Paul II asked of right. us youth. I'm not declaring myself anything. I'm responding to what John Paul II said to asking the young people to be watchmen who announce the coming of the risen Christ. I mean, this is spectacular what he said, and it's yeah. happening, and it's coming. Yes. But you know, there's been so much persecution from the bishops against me, uh, not all of them, but some of them. And from fellow uh, brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, that it played on this wound in me. To, and to the point where, Christine, it began to affect that I started to believe that even my own children and my own wife were against me. And I, I this is subtle stuff I'm talking about. Yes. But uh, it was real. And um, this was hard for my kids and my wife because they, they love me. They love me dearly like I love them. But I was believing this lie, and I began to see it. And by the fourth, fifth day of the retreat, all I can say is I have no words for the love I encountered in this retreat. I encountered God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Any atheist who sits here today and says, there's no God, I laugh in your face. With love, I laugh in your face. Because the encounter I experienced with God is so real. It's the type of encounter that the, the early church martyrs had, yes. where they went to their deaths, which seems insane to believe if, if the Christianity was just a silly ideology. Why would you go to your death? It's, it's it not so because real. of the idea. It's not, yeah, it's because they encountered Jesus. Yeah. They encountered the living God and... And this is what I encountered again. And it's not the first time for me, but I've never encountered God in this way. But Christine, by the fifth day, I remember we had a group sharing and I, I shared briefly just kind of what I said just a moment ago, that I was overwhelmed with God's love. And I said this to the group, I think there were 30 to 40 of us all in the room, just over 30. And after I said that, Christine, all of a sudden, it was like a little hole got popped in a balloon and the peace I was experiencing began to slowly drain. And by the time we got around to the end of the group and everybody was just sharing something briefly about their experience so far that week, I was irritated and I, and the peace was leaving me. And I was kind of like, what is going on here? Right. 
And Christine, I went out into the hallway and I was facing these glass doors. And um, you know what? I, I actually began to tear up, but I didn't realize, I, I realized these weren't tears of God's presence. It's one priest used to say to me many years ago, Father Kyle, he would say, tears are a presence, a sign of the Holy Spirit. Like, but that's only when they're accompanied with that peace and that love right, or joy. Right. But I didn't have any of that. And I literally began to shake and tremble. And I'm like, what's going on? So I be, I just began to, to go back through my head and playing that tape and just starting to say, I, you know, I don't know what's going on, Jesus. You got to help me. You got to come to my rescue. And I began to experience that fear again that I had going into the retreat. And all of a sudden, Christine, I saw in front of me, outside the glass doors, Satan as a large red wolf and behind him, smaller red wolves. It was a flash and I literally backpedaled. And I heard, now I didn't hear a voice, but it was communicated to me through that glass. When you leave this retreat, we are going to destroy you. We are going to devour you. That was the word. And Christine, immediately I went right into that space of fear, re remembering how I was battling right. right before the retreat. I was rebuking the enemy, praying rosaries fast. I was doing everything. And it was like, I, I, Lord, help me now. Help me. I went back to my room, Christine, and I actually contacted the retreat leader. And I said, I've been sideswiped and I need to talk to you. And so we went and I, I just told him briefly and he just cut me off. He said, Mark, you're dealing with a fear of Satan. Now, listen, I, I know as a father in my home, the authority I have over Satan, I have taken authority over evil spirits, physically attacking my children in sickness and watched them within two minutes. Suddenly a stomach cramps just stop and they go back to bed. You know, we have this authority and I understand that. But you know, when you let Satan get root a in foothold, your heart, a tiny little grip. A stronghold. It's called a stronghold. The stronghold of fear or whatever that stronghold could be lust, could be greed, it could be gluttony. When right. you let that get in there and you start to believe the lies that come with it, that becomes a stronghold for you. And we need to take out our weapons, as St. Paul says, that are not worldly weapons. They're, they're godly weapons, spiritual weapons. And the first weapon is to understand that I'm being lied to and to repent of that lie. So I did that right there. I repented of that lie. I said, Jesus, he, you know what? He led me through some little prayers and I just prayed, mm -hmm. Jesus, I'm sorry that I believe that Satan is more powerful than you. I renounce that and I repent of it in Jesus name. So you believed the wolf when he said, we're going to devour you. And then that's what you had to hear to go, I'm, you're, you can't devour me. I, You know what? I, it's, Kinda. it's. It's not, yeah, it's kind of, it's like, well, I know in some ways I'm not more power, but I also was going through remembering the experience I had where I seemed helpless and I started to worry that when I go back, I'm going to be going back into old patterns again. Cause I could, now I was seeing the patterns. I, I saw all the lies. I saw the tension between my wife and I, that I was creating it, that it, I thought it was her, that she didn't understand me, that she wasn't on the same right. page. And, you know, my readers know that Lee and I had been going through struggles. I think I wrote about that four or five years ago. And even though the Lord's been healing us, that lie hadn't been dealt with. So the tension between Lee and I was starting to increase again. And I was like, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to go back into these patterns again. I'm afraid I will. Because, you see, I, I was able to break the patterns always momentarily. But the root of them didn't come out. How do you get rid of a, of a if you the prune root. a tree? Yeah, how do you get rid of the root? If you prune a tree, it, you, the branches keep growing. You've got to go to the root and you've got to get rid of the, pull the root right out. And so now it was time at the end of this retreat to pull out the roots. And I renounced the spirit of fear, but something in me still felt there was unfinished business. And I was just about to leave when the the the... My friend, uh, Jerry, who was helping me through this, said to me, Mark, he says, are you wearing a cross? And I said, yes, I am. He said, I've got here the Jerusalem cross. This is one of the most ancient cross. He said to me, you always need to wear the cross. He says, let the cross always go before you. Now, this is what happened. As I left his office, I started going down the hallways of this retreat center. 
And I, I just, I don't want to knock this retreat center. It's a beautiful facility, but it's like so many Catholic retreat centers. It's been taken over by the new age, all kinds of new age crap going on there. Our retreat centers need to be cleaned up. Our bishops need to start taking charge of this. That's their role as good shepherds to make sure that our Catholic facilities are, are truly Catholic. Catholic. Yeah. And as I walked down the hall, I saw, I don't know how to explain this. It's like an interior vision. I saw it and I knew they were demons and they were lining the hallway. And as I walked up to them, they were bowing toward the cross on my neck. I understood this. It was really a sight to behold. And there were many of them. And as I walked into my room, all of a sudden I was filled with a holy anger. I don't know how else to explain it. What I'm going to share with you, I don't recommend anyone do this. Because I don't talk to the devil. I don't talk to Satan unless I'm rebuking him. And this is the advice and the wisdom of the church. You don't engage the enemy. Don't engage him. But I walked in and I knew I was being led by the Holy Spirit. The words came out of me before I could even think of them. I grabbed the crucifix off the wall and I went straight up to the window and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, you bow before this cross. And I repeated it again, and I saw in my mind's eye him come and kneel right before the cross. It was like a shadow, knelt right at the corner of the window. And again, I don't recommend doing this. Right, right. But the Holy Spirit was on me because Jesus was wanting to teach me something about my authority in him, his authority yes. in me, rather, over the enemy. And I said, and Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You confess now that he is Lord. And again, I heard in my heart very wimpily him say he is Lord. And I rebuked him and he fled. And Christine, I sat down and I grabbed my journal and Jesus began to pour out in my heart the most beautiful litany of the cross that I want to share with you right now, if that's okay. Please. Please. Okay. So I sat down and the first thing I sensed the Lord say to me was Satan must kneel before my cross because what he thought was victory became his defeat. He must always kneel before my cross because it is the instrument of my power and the symbol of my love and love never fails. I am love. And therefore, the cross symbolizes the love of the Holy Trinity that is going out into the world to gather the lost lambs of Israel. And then begins this litany. The cross, the cross, oh, my sweet cross, how I love you. For I swing you as a scythe to gather a harvest of souls to myself. The cross, the cross, with it you have cast not shadow, but light upon a people in darkness. The cross, the cross, you so humble and insignificant, do two beams of wood held the fate of the world upon your fibers and thus nailed the condemnation of all upon this tree. The cross, the cross, you are the font of life, the tree of life, the source of life. Plain and unattractive, you held the Savior and thus became the most fruitful tree of all. From your dead limbs have sprouted every grace and every spiritual blessing. O cross, O cross, your wood is soaked in every vein with the blood of the Lamb. O sweet altar of the cosmos, upon your splinters lay the Son of Man, the brother of all, the God of creation. O come to me, come to this cross, which is the key that unlocks all chains, that snaps their links, that scatters darkness and causes every demon to flee. For them, the cross is their condemnation. It is their sentence. It is their mirror in which they see the perfect reflection of their rebellion. And the Lord paused for a moment. And he said in my heart, and so my beloved child, I wanted you to know the new power I am placing in your hands, the power of the cross. Let it go before everything you do. Let it stand with you at all times. Cast your glance upon it frequently. Love my cross. Sleep with my cross. Eat, live, and exist always with my cross. Let it be your rear guard. Let it be your holy defense. Never ever fear the enemy 
who just bowed before the cross in your hands. And then he concluded, yes, the cross, the cross, the greatest power against evil, for with it I ransomed the souls of my brethren and emptied the bowels of hell. Amen. Christine, I uh, actually stopped, and the Lord said that specifically because I, as I heard that, I stopped and I thought, theologically, I thought, emptied the bowels of hell. Because uh, I know there's a hair, well, I think it's an error to believe that the that hell will be empty at the end of time. I, I you know, that's a teaching of church that the fires right. of hell exist, and we know from from private revelation, from what Jesus Himself has said in the scriptures, that not everybody is going to believe in Him, and that some will choose hell over heaven. We do this every time we choose mortal sin; we're choosing hell yes. over heaven, and so. I wanted to check this, and so I went later into the catechism, and sure enough, the catechism says that Jesus emptied the bowels of hell of all the righteous, like Moses, Noah, Adam, Joseph, um, when he descended there after his death. And so those who were consigned to hell who made that choice remained, but Jesus emptied hell of the, the souls who were there. So he did that because he knew that I would probably ask the question whether that all came from my head. And so... Now, here's the kicker, Christine. After I was done, I went up to the window and I looked down in the snow because there's still snow on the ground here in Canada. It had freshly snowed the night before. And there in the snow were the paw prints right up to the corner of my window and they stopped. And I just laughed. I just laughed because Jesus wanted me to understand he wants you who are listening to understand the power of his cross and i'm going to underscore this power by what i read just prior to this webcast from my daily readings here in the magnificat from the book of wisdom that you understand that the cross itself around my neck it's it's metal but what it symbolizes and what it represents is what Satan fears. In fact, let me let me share with you an anecdote. My second cousin is a Lutheran, and in their church one day, Christine, they were praying over someone, and this person began to manifest a demon. She began to growl and hiss, and all of them in the room, they were, they were praying and saying, but nothing was working, and they started to get really afraid. And all of a sudden, this possessed woman leapt up in her, in her chair and my cousin, who is a Lutheran, didn't know what to do, but she she remembered that Catholics make the sign of the cross. And so this person leapt out of her chair and began to race across the room toward her. And she just raised her hand and made the sign of the cross in the air. And she said that person literally flew back through the air like in a Hollywood movie. That's the power of the sign of the cross that alone demons flee from. And it says in the book of Wisdom, chapter 16, and this is speaking of the Israelites. When Remember, in the, remember Christine, when the Israelites were, um, they were bitten by serpents in the desert because they were planning, right? Yep. And so God ra had Moses raise up on a pole a serpent. A serpent on gold. That, that's right, that they were to look at in this, uh, I think it was a bronze serpent. Yep. And whoever looked at the serpent would be healed. And that prefigured Jesus being lifted up on the cross, in a sense, taking the curse of all mankind upon himself, and that whoever would look upon this then would be saved. Now, listen to what it says in Wisdom. When the dire venom of beasts came upon them, and they were dying from the bite of crooked serpents, your anger endured not to the end, but as a warning for a short time they were terrorized. Though they had a sign of salvation to remind them of the precept of your law. So, I mean, in that moment on that one Friday, I was shortly terrorized just for a short time. And then it says, for he who turned toward it, this bronze serpent, was saved. Not by what he saw, but by you, the Savior of all. And by this also you convinced our foes that you are he who delivers from all evil. I mean, right there in the Old Testament, saying it's the cross that we look at, and it's not the wood, it's not the metal that makes the demon flee. It's the Savior of all. 
It's the Savior of all, and the power that he lets flow through this sacramental that the enemy flees from and is destroyed by. For it says in uh, it says in Col- in Colossians chapter two, verse fifteen, it says uh, fourteen. Uh, it says so. This is yeah, cap- chapter two, verse thirteen to fifteen. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he brought you to life along with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, obliterating the bond against us with its legal claims, which was opposed to us. He removed it from our midst, nailing it to the cross, despoiling the principalities and the powers, that's the demons, and he made a public spectacle of them, leading them away in triumph by what? By what? By the cross! in which he nailed our sins upon it and the legal claims that Satan has on us. So, brothers and sisters, when Satan begins to attack you, one of your tools now is the power of the cross to you to say to him, by the power of the cross in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. In fact, one of the prayers I pray when I'm rebuking an enemy is I say, I rebuke you, I renounce you, and I bind you to the foot of the cross with the chain of Mary, and I forbid you to return. But you see, Satan did return to me because that stronghold, that fear in me, hadn't been dealt with. And Jesus, by his mercy, gave me this beautiful teaching. And it's not like this is anything new. We've known for 2,000 years the power of the cross. Even in exorcisms, priests holding cross before demons, they go nuts when they see it. Because it was upon this cross that our Savior died for us, that he's forgiven our sins. And even the worst sinner in the world has recourse to Jesus, can say to him right now, Jesus, I fall beneath you. I put myself before your cross and I bow right now that your precious blood and water would flow over me and wash me clean. I am a sinner, Lord Jesus. I repent now of pornography. I repent now of my alcoholism. I repent now of fornicating with women or with men. I repent now, Jesus, of, of denying who I am made in your image, male or female. I reject these things. I reject the lies. Jesus, have mercy on me. I come to you now. I repent of believing the lie. Jesus set me free. Jesus, I trust in you because you are greater than he who is in the world. You are greater than the devil. You are more powerful, and I believe in your power. Jesus, I trust in you, and I trust in your mercy. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. There's so much in there. I'm like, yes, and then yes, and then yes. And you know, the metaphor for Jesus allows us to, um, I, I don't know if you remember what you said, suffer or fear, or just kind of see for a short time, like it let you see the demons only so that right after he can say, but see what I have. And it, it, to me, it seemed like a metaphor for what's going on in society today, because the Bible even says it's just going to be for a short time, because if it was too long, even the, the elect would like, you know, lose it. Um, so I think Jesus is saying, I'm just gonna let you see a little bit for a little time and, and, and what you think Satan can do, but to remember that I am God and I am bigger and, and, oh my gosh, so many blessings that came out of that. Um, I wish I could remember everything that I wanted to say, but yes, how did you is. go home? Did you, did, did your wife see what a changed man you were? Did the peace cover you? Hmm. What happened? You know, my, uh, well, it was an extraordinary drive home. And, and I want to share this because it was so beautiful to me. Um, I was going to drive home in silence. And um, and I just, I, it, the whole retreat, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit were speaking in my heart, but Our Lady didn't say a word. It's so typical of her because I consecrated my oh. whole retreat to her at the beginning. But, you know, this is what Our Lady says. We know this in the story, Wedding of Cana. She just says, do whatever he tells you. And Our Lady gets out of the way. You know, I'm sorry, my dear Protestant brothers and sisters in Christ. Our Lady is your mother. She's the mother of the church. And you've misunderstood that we worship her or that we give her more credit than is due. She's the mother of us. And she knows how to mother us in the right way. Because the way she mothers us is tells us to go to Jesus and do whatever he tells you. So this is so important. In breaking those lies, I knew that I had to live always in the divine will and never depart from God's will, always to live in his will and never give a crack in anything to the enemy. And if I do, 
if I go, sometimes I get nervous when I'm I'm working and I, I go up the stairs and I'll start eating <laughs> just to deal with my nerves. Right, right. So just stuff like that. Like just see it, stop it. Just say, oops, sorry, Jesus. I'm filling yeah. my veins. It's okay. Just stop. Just stop. Ask the Lord's forgiveness. Start over. But I got in the car and I'm sitting there and I invited Our Lady to be with me. And I said, let's drive home in silence. I sensed Our Lady saying, no, turn on your music. So I turned on my albums that I recorded and I started with the album I wrote in 1999 and Christine, as I listened, I realized there was another lie and that I had rejected my own gifts to a certain degree. I have rejected my gifts, rejected my voice. I'm not a big fan of my voice. And so I rejected it, rejected my music, and I repented of that right there. I said, I'm so sorry, Jesus. You've given me these gifts. I'm so sorry. And it doesn't mean that suddenly I think I'm the greatest artist in the world. I'm not. I'm a very simple artist. But as I listened to the music, God's healing. I was being healed by my own music. I mean, how many people write their own soundtrack for their own spiritual journey? I mean, it's so cool. But what I saw was during the whole retreat, all the songs I'd written on my album called Deliver Me From Me, they were the soundtrack for that entire retreat. In fact, one of my songs on that album, Christine, is is a, based on St. Patrick's Breastplate. And St. Patrick's Feast Day was, I think, on the Thursday of that retreat. I, I, mean, I started yeah. laughing. I'm on my way home, and the Spirit even tells me, set your cruise control at this speed. And I under I just knew it. He wanted he wanted me to get there and for everything to be timed. So I did. And then as I was driving, he said, "Take this turn off. I want you to go through the valleys and hills." And so when I arrived to the valleys and hills, just short of our our acreage out here, yeah. as I got there, one of the songs on my albums, I'm singing this line: "I'm making my way on a journey through the valleys and hills of my heart." I just laugh. I, I mean, you just want to cry because you're like, God, you didn't forget me. Yeah, you can't make it up. And God, he's been doing that ever since now. Um, like this reading you heard from Wisdom was a preparation for this webcast, a, a confirmation in God's word of the power of the cross, that when we look upon the cross, we can be healed by him through that cross, through that sign and symbol, which he himself laid upon, you know, in the movie with the passion of the Christ, we see Mel Gibson's character, Jim Caviezel, kissing the cross. Jesus kissed it. it you know, who, who kisses their sufferings? Right. But this is what Jesus wants you and I to do now. He wants us to see that he's more powerful than anything that come in the world. Satan's going to throw at the world another plague. He's going to throw at us a serious plague that's going to come that has the potential to scare everyone. It'll be serious. But we, if we enter into this place of absolute trust in the Father, then we will understand we'll have a divine paradigm, which is to see that all things work to the good for those who love him. And the truth is that the world needs to go through a purification, starting with the Roman Catholic Church. She is in dire need of a purification and it may mean we will lose the Vatican, we will lose our local parishes, we will lose everything and have nothing left but the forest to go into with a little bit of bread and a little bit of fermented grape juice, that is some fermented wine. And it's all we'll have. And if that's what God has to do to restore his people to that joy and peace and glory, which he has destined for us from the, the beginning of time to be a bride, not just this 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 broken little woman who he's just kind of getting us scraping us through the doors of saint peter's no he's creating a bride who will be spotless and unblemished and who he is going to restore in us the the divine will that adam forfeited and all those rights that belong to it in order to bring all of creation to perfection this is what's coming in the air of peace it's wait. not the end of the world i cannot and if we, wait yeah and if we keep listening to the headlines we're we're, we're just, gonna miss it oh, look how bad it is look how awful i mean yeah. we're seeing evil on a level i've never seen and we will never ever see again jesus said this in matthew he says the tri tribulation is coming there'll be nothing like it that comes or anything like it afterwards well why would he say that because if it's supposed to be the end of the world why would he even need to say that it's not going to be afterwards right Because it's not the end of the world Revelation 19 and 20. It's the era of peace that's coming that has now been confirmed in 
Fatima and private revelation throughout the world that has been some of it approved that yes. there's an era of peace coming. And so right now, God wants to deliver his people from the spirit of fear, the demon of fear. And you who are listening, you're so privileged, I think, to hear, not me, to hear what Jesus has said and done in this thing that I experienced, because you have an opportunity now to enter into the silence and ask Jesus to reveal in your heart, show me the lies I've believed about myself. Show me the lies I'm believing. Show me the judgments I'm holding against my spouse, against my brothers and sisters in my family, my uncles, my aunts, against my friends and my community, the people I know. Show me these and let me repent of them. And as the Holy Spirit reveals them to you, just say, okay, I thank you, Lord. I You can write these down on a paper. Just write them down. And then when you're done you know, listen again. And if the Holy Spirit brings up another name, oh yeah, you know what? I keep saying this about this neighbor, but you know, I don't know his heart. Then write it down and then just pray over these things and say, I repent of these things, Jesus. I repent of these judgments. I renounce these lies. And I believe in your truth that's in the Bible, that's in God's word. And I hope to write about these things on the now word uh, very soon. Um, and then ask his forgiveness and take that piece of paper and go and burn it. Burn it and say, I renounce this in the name of Jesus. And let the Lord begin to set you free now because there's going to be a global exorcism. It's We're going to need it. Yeah, it's yeah. called the illumination of conscience or warning. It's going to be the moment when the entire world, like the prodigal son, is going to have an illumination of conscience. We're all going to see how we've left the father's house. Yes. And, to, and we're going to see it all at once as opposed to over a nine-day retreat. Or really, for me, it's been over a year of the Lord slowly showing me. And many people who are watching now, you're, you're starting to experience the first light of this dawn that is coming. Even before the sun rises, there's this light of dawn. Don't fight it. Let the Lord illuminate your heart. Let him see you. Because the fruit of this, if I can be so bold as to say, for me has been a new humility. I... I just see in myself where I was and and even the strength I thought I had that I could fight these weapons without dealing with the lies that has humbled me in a great way. And now I'm, now I'm more cognizant. Now I'm more humble and aware of every moment of what I'm doing. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness. And so, um, even yesterday, I was starting to get caught up and, oh, I got so much to do. It's so much. And it wasn't until night that I prayed. And I, I, by the end of the day, you know, I lost my peace because I'm, I was doing things that needed to be done, but in the wrong order. So we need to seek first the kingdom. And so this morning's prayer, this is what the Lord showed me. And if I'd have skipped it, you wouldn't have heard this reading from wisdom, right? So anyway, I, I, I'm so delighted that you let me share this with you and with your readers and I, and I pray in Jesus name that you will that you will not be afraid we 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 even now in Jesus name we take authority over that spirit of fear uh that's trying to work through this webcast and we 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 prayed it before and we pray it now we command you to be silent so that the spirit of god the holy spirit can speak now to your hearts and begin to fill your hearts because brothers and sisters as it says in 1 John perfect love who is the holy spirit Perfect love casts out all fear. And you need to empty your heart now so that perfect love can come in and you can live in that place of peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I've been dying to say this for the past half hour. That litany is your next song. The cross, <laughs> the cross. I Since you first said it, I'm like, that wasn't meant to remain in your journal. You never know. And right? then you kept going. No, I know. You got to listen to what I'm saying. God's speaking through me. Write the dang song. <laughs> I think that's what God said. The dang song. Right. The dang. Write the dang song. <laughs> but it, it, it was too powerful. You were right. Those words were not yours. Those were the words of the Holy Spirit. The cross, the cross. Please consider it. Because yeah, I, I kept hearing it when that needs to be put in music. That needs to mm -hmm. go out. We need to hear those words. It's, it's just not supposed to be trapped in your journal. And, and and then when you went on and you talked about your music, I was like, for me, it was confirmation that what I was hearing when you first said it was like, you need to do that. God, use your voice that you didn't really like before. It doesn't matter if you like it. We 
the people need to hear Jesus come through his chosen yeah. vessel, which well, I got, is you. I got some ideas, so I'll work on it. All right. All right. I want to hear that. Um, geez, it's so funny because I usually say name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today. Um, I just feel like you've given it to them, but let's do yeah. it anyway. Name no, one thing you'd have our listeners do differently. Start praising the Lord in your car. Start giving thanks to him every day. Stop starting your day with, oh, crap, or, oh, man. It's you Monday know, again. That's the morning demon right there in your head. The first thing is the worry. Stop. You might, maybe you have to go to court in the morning, you know? You got to get to go to court case. Whatever it is, start your day. Shut shut the noise. Fold the wings of your intellect, as Catherine Doherty would say. And start by thanking God in the morning. You know how you enter into God's presence? It says right in the Bible, enter his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with praise. Start thanking him. Thank you, Jesus, that I am alive. Thank you, Lord, that you love me. Thank you that I've been baptized. Thank you for my family. Thank you, Jesus, that I, even though I can't use my legs and I have to get in that wheelchair, I still have my arms. Thank you, Jesus, that even though I'm paralyzed from the neck down, I still have my voice. I can still talk. I can still see. Thank you, God. I mean, for me, I'm deaf in one ear. I can still hear in one ear. Thank you, Jesus. You know, and it, it, it maybe it's just one thing. You get up and you say, thank you, God, for that beautiful sunset or sunrise this morning. Or maybe you just get up and say, thank you for my, my grandkids. Thank you, Jesus. And give him praise. And we, we Catholics have all these litanies, these beautiful prayers. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, right now in my Ever bedroom, in my kitchen, be. right here, right now, his glory. And will be now and forever. Amen. So there's my advice. Start everything with thanks, giving, and praise. And when that spirit of negativity, and that was the real spirit behind what I went through, was a spirit of negativity that I was entertaining over and over again as it played this thing in my head that you're persecuted, you're unloved, you're unliked. I was listening to a spirit of negativity. Reject that spirit. And St. Paul says in, uh, in, I think it's Philippians, he says, whatever is good, Whatever is true, pure. whatever is pure, whatever is beautiful, whatever is lovely, think about these things. Meditate, yeah. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. C can I just say that again? Whatever is good, pure, lovely, beautiful, holy, St. Paul says, think about these things. So sure, scan the headlines and then toss them aside. This is That's the devil circus. Everything I think going he even on used the, the word circus. ponder, didn't he? Didn't even say ponder. Like we don't well, just think yeah, about it. I depending ponder. on the, on the uh, translation, yeah, ponder these things. Think about these things. Mm -hmm. But 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 yeah. the point, no matter what word is used, is don't just make it a cursory glance. Don't right. ponder the negativity for ninety percent of your day Amen. and say thank you, God, I love you for ten percent. Ponder the goodness yeah. for the 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 ninety percent. Just let yourself, you know, be steeped in it. Yeah. So that when the bullets hit you, it doesn't matter. You're just like, yeah. I have good, holy, pure, whatever. It is Amen. such a good message to send people. I, I tell it to my standards. I tell it to my clients. And when you're looking at the potential death of your child, when you're looking yeah. at your bankruptcy, when you're looking at, these are all very real things. I am not going to minimize them at all. Not going to. But then what I usually do is I close my eyes like right now and I see um, like a neon cross. It's illuminated. And I allow myself to let it remain neon. And I focus just on the cross. And then if other yeah. thoughts I go right back to that cross. And when you ponder the cross, you can't look at two things at once. That's why God gave us periphery, but we can only focus on one thing. So if you're focusing on the cross, I tell them you can't yeah. see the negative things that are happening. So that's really fix your gaze. And, and maybe we need to say this. It's, it's not about being fake. The, doesn't it say in the Bible, weep with those who weep, mourn with yes. those who mourn. There's a time for war and a time for peace, a time to weep and a time for rejoicing. Jesus wept, as we heard in the gospel on Sunday, yeah. outside Lazarus' tomb. So um, there, what, we're, what I'm saying here is when St. Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances, rejoice always. Give thanks in all circumstances. If you're about to bury your child that day, how do you do that? Well, first of all, 
it's to understand the, the divine perspective and that all these things, which are, are crosses, are difficult, God still uses them to the good. And, and as a Christian, we have to have that faith perspective always that all of this is passing. All of it is surpassing. And, yes. and even if I were to have all of my kids and all of my health, I'm it's still different. dying. I, you know, as my uncle once said, he says, you know, he says, uh, what he says, uh, he says, being uh, born, he says, is a fatal disease. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. You begin dying the day you're born. Yeah, you, you, you do. You begin the journey toward heaven. So it, it's not about faking it, but it's about saying, Lord, my heart is broken today. I, you know, I mean, let's just use a horrible example. Lord, I have to bury my loved one. But I give thanks to you today, Lord, that you are still God. I give thanks today. The sun is shining. I give thanks to you, Lord, that you are still constant love. And even though everyone on this planet is going to die, and some of us before our time, Jesus, I trust in you. Be with me now. Walk with me. Journey with me. Cry with me. And he will. I know Jesus cried with me when I lost my sister. When she was 22, I was 19. He was there. And all the days and months and years ahead when I cried, he was there. But the thing is that we reject despair as Christians. And we can cry and we can cry hard. And sometimes we need to go out and do what we call the primordial scream. When you're struggling and you don't get God, well, go out and just scream. Yeah. And tell God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. But God, I surrender. I abandon to you. I trust in you, Jesus. You said you would be with us until the end of time. And you are. And here you are. Even though I can't hear you, I can't feel anything. I'm so numb. Jesus, I trust in you. And as it says in, um, in, my, in my readings this morning, I was reading, it says, wait on the Lord. It says, wait on the Lord. Be strong, be stout-hearted, and wait for the Lord. One of the things the Lord said to me on the retreat, Mark, I want steadfast love. It's in the Bible, Hosea 6.6. 6. Steadfast love. We need to, The Lord loves us with a steadfast love. He's now asking you and I to love him with a steadfast love. Don't just love him when the sun shines. Don't just love him when the bounty comes in or when everything's good. Love the Lord your God with all your strength and all your heart and all your soul at all times. And this is really the test of the Christian, Christine, is do we love the Lord only when it's good or do we love him when things are bad? And I love it what, uh, what uh, Father Walter Chiswick, servant of God, Father Walter Chiswick said. He said, be consoled in those times. He said, you idiot, but don't be fooled. You idiot. Yeah, he says, don't be, back. don't be an idiot, he says. He says, what we need is humility. And so humility says to me right now that even though I'm experiencing great graces from this retreat, the dry times will come again. They will come again. The trials will come again. Hardships will come. Yeah. Death will come to my family. It's inevitable. Hardships will come. Bad health will come because it comes to everybody. All these things come. So now it's just letting go. Letting go and saying, Jesus, you know, one of the things I struggle with, Christine, I'll be honest with you, is aging. I really struggle with it because that when the bloom starts coming off the flower, if you know what I mean, you start looking in the mirror and seeing, oh, my gosh, like I'm dying. I, I'm, I'm slowly beginning like a tree in the fall to lose my color. The leaves are fading and the inevitability of this is I'm going six feet into the ground. And I, it's one of the things I repented about on the retreat was the fear of not not dying. I'm not afraid to die. I, I can't wait to be with God. It's the fear of this whole process of appearing to my grandkids is kind of this, you know, wrinkly thing with spots. And, you know, how we as kids, we look up at older people and well, I'm becoming that slowly. Now I'm going to become that. So are you. And so are all of you who are watching. And it happens so fast. So fast overnight. It has actually, it's so funny because I have been pondering oh. that lately. I, I didn't mind aging. And then all of a sudden everything's sagging. And it was funny yep. story driving with gravity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was with my grandchildren, the seven and a five-year-old and we we're driving to an event and somehow he's talking about old people looking old. And I said, well, do I look old? You know, see him in the rear of your mirror. So do I look old? He goes, yeah, you do. And he goes, but you don't act old. <laughs> I was like, 
um, don't look old. I mean, look old, but don't act old. Yeah, I'll take it. But it, it really is something that I, I've been, yeah. I think it hits all of us. And I've been thinking yeah. lately too, is that something everyone, because you only go through this phase once, right? But do we all have to go through this letting go and realizing your pretty years are done, your painful years are here, your but you know what? One day closer to heaven. And that's why I keep asking the Lord, okay, yeah, help me with this aging, but one day closer to heaven. One and here's here's the beautiful thing about it is that if we accept it and embrace it and it's God's will, if God wanted to do it a different way, he could have done it a different way, but Jesus didn't. Even God went to the cross and suffered and died and lost his beauty on the cross. Yes. And so he's showing us the path that unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. So we need to embrace this dying of our flesh. Our spirit isn't dying. Our spirit is being renewed day after day. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, the preacher, uh, Father Dennis Faneth on a retreat, I'm not sure his age, but he's getting he's up there because he's been around for decades. I've known him. He's a household name, a beautiful anointed priest. And when he preached, it was just as powerful as when I heard him as a kid in the 70s, just as powerful. And the Lord taught me through. He said, you know what? The spirit is always new. And as a Christian, those who follow me and my spirit, what you speak and what you do will always be new. It will always be creating. It will always be something for the body of Christ, even though the earthen vessel you have is becoming cracked and drying. And even that is a blessing because you know what it's doing? It's it's helping you and I uh, in our vanity to die to ourselves, to, to die to go. our vanity, to let go. And to be more ready for heaven. I have Amen. said that and yeah. had this conversation with several clients, actually, who are also dealing with this. So I think it was providential that you brought up aging, but this idea that the bell curve, right? You're young and you go through your broken teeth and then yeah. you get this beautiful phase in the middle and then we start failing. But when we start failing, when we no longer care about our appearance, care about your appearance, but I'm not like, oh, I'm going to wear this nice outfit. I look great. Right. But if God didn't intentionally take our looks, our hair, our things from us, we would be clinging to the world more. So the more we right. lose, the more ready we are to go, God, I can't wait to go to heaven. I'll have my mm. youth and vibrance back. But I think it is God's way of saying, but if I didn't take it from you, you wouldn't focus on heaven. You wouldn't prepare yourself and yeah. you need to be prepared because once you start aging, people start thinking I'm going to die soon. And they kick their butts in gear and they start doing what they need to do. M many, right? Not all. I wish it were all, but only many. And so, you know. Yeah. Oh, beautifully said. Yeah. No, yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's so important. So hopefully we're helping people who have a fear of aging now, a fear of exactly. maybe dying and so on. Don't be afraid because God's going to give it to you. You're going to get it all back. So in a look, better version, in a better version you're and change in your, you go for a, um, you know, Lamborghini. And, and, and let's just say this, let's just say you, let's just say God made it such a, none, none of us, we all reach the age of 33 and none of us ages or anything. Let's just say we still have to die. Death mm -hmm. still has to come. He still has to take us through the veil to the other side. And so, so death had to come. Death entered the world by sin. It is what it is, but God's making all these things work to the good for those who love, love him. him. If you don't love him, if you don't love God, these things become a terror to you. They become, a, a, and this is exactly what we're seeing. This is the end times, the world trying to find a way to create longevity, eternity for man, to be able to control everything. To cling to it. Yeah, the elixir of living forever because they don't yeah. they don't believe in God. So therefore, we must end all death, and the only way that's going to happen is by controlling every aspect of human life, is which is what we're seeing. So God's going to shatter that. He's going to throw the beast into the pit, and the air of peace will come as Amen. the final phase of the church to prepare us interiorly as the bride of Christ, and then when we get to heaven. We will shed this tent and God will give us a glorified, resurrected body. It will be your body and it will be wait. resurrected and no more pain, no more sorrow, no more darkness. I can't wait, Christine. Cannot Not wait. that I'm in a hurry because I have beautiful grandkids right. and a lovely wife and children that I want to see. But uh, you know what? If the day comes, it comes and I will embrace it because I want to see Jesus face to face. I really do. Amen. That is such <laughs> a funny, it was a good place to end the show, but I love 
you made my point. I said that once you have grandchildren, you totally forget your kids' names. And you said, <laughs> I'm, I want my grandchildren and my wife and kids too. You yeah. cannot threw them in there. <laughs> so I get it. It's like, love our grandchildren, no matter what. My daughter's like, he could rob a bank and you'd still love him yeah, pretty much, you know? <laughs> yeah, you would. Yeah. Uh, but for those of you watching, and if you aren't familiar with Mark Mallet, I want you to get familiar with him. Go to the nowword.com, which is where you will find his writings. You can all also find him on countdown to the kingdom.com. That's dot com too as well. Mark? That's that's right. Yeah, countdown yes. to the kingdom.com. Right? Any anywhere else that you want them to find. So they're gonna find your writings on the nowword.com and a lot of your videos on Countdown to the Kingdom. You don't put too many of them on uh, YouTube anymore, so they're on Rumble, correct? Yeah, we, we we do that because we were censored, so we went to another platform. Correct. And, uh, it's correct. been working, yeah. But if you go directly to the website, you will find any, and if you subscribe, you will actually have these things sent to you. That's right. As you know, and I remind you on every podcast I do, subscribe to those people whose voice you appreciate because one day. Um, we're not going to be passive receivers. We're going to have to search for it because it's going to be hidden from us. Yeah. And so uh, also I'd like you to, uh, I'd be honored if you'd like me on my platforms, Instagram, Facebook. I, I like YouTube. you. I like you too. Right? You like, cause you like bacon and eggs. <laughs> so I do. Um, go Canadian. ahead and hey. subscribe, subscribe to all my channels. This show what you can find it on my website, breakfast dot breakfastwithbacon.com. If you don't find it on the social media channels anymore because it was censored, you always go to breakfastwithbacon.com. And I just so appreciate your um I don't like the word patronage, but you know, finding the stuff that I do and write and and put out because the Lord thank brings you, guests like this. <laughs> Are you saying that sarcastically or seriously? No, thank you for all you're doing. Oh, you know, well, thank you. But yeah, God is bringing me guests like this. So we're like, we've got to get these messages out. Fear not. Fear not. God is always Amen. there. So um, I think that's it. So you know how I take the show off the air, don't you, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Something uh, to do with eggs. Something to do with eggs. I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You have been watching or listening to Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd like to remind you always to live your life. Sunny side up or medium poached? Easy, over easy. <laughs> okay, I'll go with that.